Hey guys, welcome back to this explainable AI series. Today we want to have a closer look at one of the most popular methods for explaining black box algorithms, which is LIME. LIME stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. And as the name implies, it's model agnostic, therefore it can be used for any machine learning model. Let's first talk about the idea and motivation behind this approach. Think of the stroke dataset we've used in the last video Imagine we train a black box algorithm on two features of this data set. This could be things like age or body mass index. After the training, the decision boundary of our complex model could look like this. So that's just an example. For a new data point, if it falls into the blue area, we predict no stroke, otherwise we predict stroke. So the prediction we make is highly nonlinear, or in other terms, there is no easy to explain relationship in how we perform a prediction. The model just learned some complex patterns as a combination of those two features. If we make a prediction for John now, for instance stroke, how could we explain to him why our model outputs stroke? We cannot easily summarize the whole decision boundary into one explanation. The basic idea of LIME is that we just zoom into the local area of the individual prediction. There we can easily create a simple explanation that makes sense in that local region. This way we don't have to worry about the rest of the model and still get a valid explanation why that prediction was made. For instance, in this example we could say that the prediction was made because the value of feature 2 was small enough to fall on the left side of this dashed line. We can also say something about the importance of our variables. Certainly feature 2 here mainly determines our output class and changes in feature 1 almost have no impact. If you've watched the second video of the series about by design interpretable models, you probably recall how we can interpret linear regression or simple decision trees. To get such kind of explanations, LIME simply fits a linear interpretable model in that local area, which is often also called surrogate. It's basically a local approximation of our complex model in this local area. So that's the basic idea and now let's have a look at this in more detail. LIME was presented in the paper on the right and aims to explain any black box model by creating such a local approximation. The complex models are complete black boxes and the internals are hidden for LIME. So it's just based on the inputs and outputs of a model. It works on almost any input such as text, tabular data, images or even graphs. Usually the domain experts in a certain field, let's say medicine, have some prior knowledge about the problem. For example, sports has a positive impact on the overall health. If the Lyme explanation tells us that sports increases the probability of a stroke, there's most likely something wrong in our developed model. So that helps to build trust and we can assess whether it makes sense or not. In the paper they also state that providing explanations improves the acceptance of a predictive algorithm. For LIME the only requirement is that the explanations are locally faithful, but they might not make sense globally. So we just focus on that local area around our prediction. Now let's have a look at the mathematical optimization problem used in LIME. The idea behind it is actually quite intuitive. As already mentioned we want to create a local approximation of our complex model for a specific input. For instance we know the properties of John in a tabular format, so that would be our input data point x. In this optimization formula from the LIME paper, the complex model is denoted with f and the simple model, so the local model, is denoted with g. This simple model small g comes from a set of interpretable models, which is denoted with a capital G here. Capital G is a family of linear models such as linear regression and all its variants. In the LIME paper, this family is set to sparse linear models. We will further talk about this in a second. Now this first loss term in our optimization function simply means that we look for an approximation of the complex model f by the simple model g in the neighborhood of our data point x. In other terms we want to get a good approximation in that local neighborhood. The third argument pi here defines the local neighborhoods of that data point and is some sort of proximity measure. We will see more details in a minute. The second loss term is used to regularize the complexity of our simple surrogate model. 
For a linear regression, for instance, a desirable condition could be to have many zero-weighted input features. So basically ignoring most of the features and just including a few. This makes our explanations more simple. For a decision tree, it would be nice to have a relatively small depth that stays comprehensible for humans. So overall, this omega is a complexity measure and as this optimization problem is a minimization problem, we want to minimize the complexity. In summary, this loss function says that we look for a simple model G, so this is the argument in the argmin, that minimizes those two loss terms, so it should approximate the complex model in that local area and additionally stay as simple as possible. Now, how is this first loss term calculated? So on the right you see the decision boundary of our complex model F again, zoomed into that local area of our prediction for John. In the first step we simply generate some new data points in the neighborhood of our input data point. More specifically, we randomly generate data points everywhere, but as we will see in a second, they will be weighted according to the distance to our input data point, as we are just interested in the local area around our input. These data points are generated by perturbations. So for instance, we can slightly increase the age, decrease the body mass index and so on. This can be achieved by sampling from a normal distribution with the mean and standard deviation for each feature. Then we get the prediction for these data points using our complex model F. So here all the points in the blue area would be predicted as no stroke and the ones on the other side as stroke. What we end up with is a new data set we can use to fit a classifier. We have the labels which come from the predictions of the complex model F and we have all the feature values which are simply the sampled new data points. So we minimize the first loss term by simply getting the highest accuracy on that new data set using a simple linear model. For a linear regression, for instance, we minimize the sum of square distances between the predictions and the ground truth. In the line paper, they use this loss function for optimizing a linear model. It's basically the sum of square distances between the label, which comes from the complex model, and the prediction of the simple model G. Additionally, the proximity pi is added to weight the loss according to how close a data point is. For instance, classifying this black data point wrong is not relevant because it falls out of the local neighborhoods. In the paper they use an exponential kernel as distance metric, so we can think of this like a heat map. The points that are close to our input data point are weighted the most. That's how we ensure that the model is locally faithful. Ok, so the first part of that loss function should make sense now. What about the omega at the end? We said we use it to make sure that our model stays simple. In Lime, a sparse linear model is used. The advantage of this is that we additionally take care of the second loss term, because sparse linear models aim to produce as many zero weights as possible. In practice, this can be achieved by using a regularization technique, such as done for lasso linear regression, for instance. This way we ensure to get a simple explanation with only a few relevant variables. So that's how we also take care of the second loss term. Now it's time for some code. Let's have a look at how we can apply Lime on our dataset. Okay, so here we are back in VS Code. First we import a couple of things. That data loader I've shown in the last video, which simply fetches our data, which is a CSV file, in a tabular format. And then uh, the random forest classifier, which will serve as our black box model in this case, as it's an ensemble model that cannot be easily interpreted. Then we import some metrics like the F1 score and the accuracy score. As we have an imbalanced data set, it makes sense to also look at recall and precision. Then we import Lime tabular, which is Lime for tabular data. And it comes from Microsoft's interpret um, library. And as you see, it's for black box algorithms. And finally, we import the show function, which helps us to create this interactive plot. So in the second cell, we load the data set using this load data set function, which simply gets the data as CSV from pandas. And then we pre-process it using the pre-process function. Here we do some imputations and one hot encodings. And after that, we simply split the data set into 20% test data and 80% train data. And then we do some oversampling to ensure that our minority class gets more importance in our predictions. So let's run those first two cells. It's 
opening our Jupyter Notebook. And now what we do is we create this random forest classifier and fit it using our data. And as you can see, the accuracy is much better than the previous models we had. And also our F1 score is slightly increased. It's still not good as it's a relatively complex imbalanced data set, but accuracy is pretty good. So we can continue with that. And now what we do is we use this line tabular class and use our random forest classifier or more specifically the prediction probabilities and pass it our data set. And what we can do now is we can pass the first or the last 20 instances of our data set to make Lime explain them locally. And what that does is simply creating those local explanations we've just seen. That means we fit a local model in the area around each of those 20 data points. So let's run this. And this will take some time as we have to fit an entirely new model and also sample a data set for each of those 20 data points. Okay, so now it's done. And after calling this show function on our local explanations, we get this interactive graph, which comes from this interpret library. So we've trained our random forest classifier with 94% accuracy, but can we be sure that the model really uses the right features and works as intended? And to better understand that, we can now have a look at individual predictions and here we see we have, for example, an actual value of zero, which means no stroke. And we have predicted 0.01 as prediction probability. So that's also pretty close to zero. And the reason for that is, so these are the features or the feature values used by our model. And the age is, has a strongly negative impact because the age is relatively low for a stroke prediction. Uh, and that's why the prediction is shifted towards no stroke. Also that the person has no hypertension, no heart disease, and so on. Um, these are reasons why the model says this person is not getting a stroke. If we have a look at another prediction here, which is also predicting no stroke, we see that the age is 22 here, so relatively young. And that's why the age has an even stronger impact for this individual prediction. So as you can see, Lime can also be used on any black box model to get those kind of explanations we've also seen in a previous video. So we've seen how we can use Lime to create helpful local explanations to validate our black box model. As mentioned before, Lime can also be applied on other data inputs. Here's an example for images. As you can see, depending on the prediction, we get different areas in our input which are marked as most important for the prediction. Here's another example for text data. This example shows how helpful Lime can be for validating a model. On the left, we can see that the output class was atheism with 58% probability. And in the middle, we can see hosting, hosts, NNTP and edu led to a prediction for atheism. However, with our domain knowledge, we know that those words have nothing to do with the religion. And that's why we can say there's something going wrong in this model. In the paper, they also suggest to always look at several local predictions to get a global understanding of what our model is doing. So that's it for today. I try to keep it short. If there's anything else you're interested in, just let me know in the comments. See you in the next video where we will have a look at another popular method called SHEP. Thanks for watching and have a great day.